Hello and welcome to Learn the Bible. This is post 134, Leviticus 6, 8 through 7, 21, the offering law of the priests. This is part of the offering series on part six. Okay, so we are on the offerings part six. This is going to be the laws specifically to the priests. So we've already talked about each of the offerings that's in parts one through five. And now we're going to focus on how the priests were to behave during that time. All right, so starting with the burnt offering. So the burnt offering, it would take time to consume the burnt offerings because these offerings were extensive. Parts of the offerings were offered every evening and every morning. So every evening they would start burning it and they would have to burn it till it was completely consumed. And then by the following morning, they would start all over again. They would burn all day. And then again, by the evening, they would have to start all over again. So these priests had to be dressed in their linen clothes during the time that they were making this offering. And they would have to make sure the linen clothes completely covered their body from head to toe. Um, and then they would take up the ashes from this burnt offering and they would take it and set it beside them in the altar. Then the priest would have to go and take off this bloody and ash covered outfit and switch it out for very brand, uh, very clean garments. So these are a clean linen garment. Um, and then they would take the ashes from the offering they had burnt, take it across and then take it outside the camp to a clean place. So the fire of the altar was never to go out in order to maintain these continual sacrifices. I mean, to burn up something and to just ash takes some time. Um, I've burnt some things on the grill, but they've never just turned to ash. So these burnt offerings were taking up the time on that brass altar pretty much all day, every day. And when other offerings came in, the burnt offering had to be burned hotter and more quickly to make room for these additional offerings. So the priest who actually offered the burnt offering, if they had the burnt offering as their offering, they got to keep the hide of the offering. So the first thing that's going to stick out about this offering is the fact that it was ongoing for as long as the tabernacle was standing. I mean, it was going on all the time. If the tabernacle was set up, it was burning. That may seem a bit excessive to have these continuous sacrifices all around the clock, all day, every day. But that does teach us something about God's justice. There is no sin that exists that doesn't have a huge cost. There is no sin that doesn't lead to hell. There's no sin that God can simply ignore. And that's all over the Bible it talks about. There has to be justice. He is too righteous. He is way too righteous to just ignore our sin. Every crime has to be paid for. And the payment for sin is an eternity in hell. But if something is going to pay your penalty for sin, to take your place, that requires their lives. The shedding of blood is necessary to pay for sin. So think about the incalculable amount of animals that were paid for that just to cover the sin of one man. I mean, that's how many animals animals would have to be sacrificed day and night to cover our own sin. Because Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the, on the Mount that even in our hearts, things we think, evil thoughts are also sin. So then if we're talking about someone paying for all sin once and for all, well, one, in order to save a human, you have to have a perfect human to pay for their sin. And Jesus accomplished that. He was the perfect human. But there's more than one human at stake. There's a whole world full of humans that need saved. So that's why God himself had to be the sacrifice. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He was fully human and he was fully God. He came. He lived the perfect life. He made, paid for our mistakes. And all that remains for us is to accept him. And if you accept him, you are cleansed from all your sin. The second thing you notice is that the priest begins the sacrifice wearing the priestly garments and then he has the blood of the sacrifice splattered on him. It's spilled on him as he's making the sacrifice. And we also know that he would get the ash on him and he would get to keep the hide of the sacrifice. So he would then offer it on the altar and he would burn the sacrifice. Then he'd gather up those ashes and then he would go and change his garment. So he'd have to carry those ashes in this clean garment now, take it out and bury it outside the camp in a clean place. So we already talked about how that clean place in the previous uh, discussion about the offerings um, 
how the clean place talks about Jesus' tomb cut out of the rock. But here we see we're talking about the priests, right? So in this situation, we think of we think of ourselves. Whenever people look at themselves, if you ask anybody, hey, what do you think of yourself? Well, I'm a good guy. I'm a decent person. I love my family. I do this. I do that. But at the end of the day, even though we do have some good features, we overall also have a lot of evil ones and sinful ones. And when we compare our best day to Jesus Christ, it's filthy. When we can compare our righteousness, our good works, our good deeds, our good thoughts, they compare nothing to what true righteousness is. And the only one who's ever been truly righteous is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that our righteousness is dirty rags, right? So even in our filthy state, even when we're covered in that filth and that dirt, we know that the blood of Christ that touches us washes us and then replaces our sin-stained robes. The Bible says that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That means that his blood actually cleans us, although to the world, blood is considered a stain. Biblically, it's considered a cleansing power that will clean you whiter than anything you could imagine. So even, even whenever we try, we do our best, we try our best to be righteous, it's never good enough. We need the blood of Christ to give us a new heart and new robes to make us white. And that's what Jesus promises. He says that you'll be clothed in white. And that's talking about being clean from all unrighteousness when we go to eternal life. So just like you cover yourself with an animal's hide, this is the other part. Remember, the priest got to keep the hide. If somebody right now wants to look, you've heard of the uh, the old old uh, line they would give to in kids' stories. It was a sheep. Uh, it was a wolf in sheep's clothing because the wolf would cover himself in the hide of a sheep and act like a sheep. And of course, it's used as an analogy for people who are, you know, trying to identify as something they're not. But in this situation, you would take these animals and you could identify with the animal. Well, remember, Jesus Christ paid for our sins. He was our sacrifice. And just like the priests got to take the hide of the lamb or the goat or the cow or whatever and keep it for themselves, we also identify with Christ. We put on the identity of Christ. Because who was Jesus Christ? He was the holy and only Son of God. What do you get if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? You get to become the son or daughter of God. You become a child of God. And that's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. That hide is meant that we get to identify as Jesus. When God looks at us, despite all the things we've done that are hell deserving, we know that Jesus Christ paid for our sins and we can identify with him and be accepted into the family of God. We're adopted into God's family. And then, then you also talk about the ashes that were carried outside the camp. And of course, we already mentioned that Jesus was taken out because he was buried outside the camp. And if you ever hear about baptism, baptism where you go into the water, you start as a filthy person, then you die by being dunked in the water. Right? And some, some uh, faiths, they sprinkle the water. But the point being, they put you under the water to clean you. And then while you're under the water, you are symbolizing Jesus' death. And then you come back out a new creature. That's his resurrection. And we identify with that Beth, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in that baptism. And it's a great thing to do. If you are saved, you want to publicly declare that you identify with Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. And then the last thing we'll talk about with this uh, rules for the burnt offering is that the priests were covered head to toe. They were covered from their neck down um, with their outfits. And this is a clear lesson. So the um, idea that your body had to be completely covered is also symbolic of the fact that we can never, ever achieve righteousness with our own works. And we think about Cain who went and he offered the best of his fruits and vegetables and he failed. We look at Adam and Eve, whenever they had sinned, they went and grabbed these fig leaves and sewed them together and I'm sure made wonderful outfits, yet they failed. The only people who can, who can succeed in covering their own sin is when someone else pays for it. The sacrifice of an animal in this picture and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our picture. So in the burnt offering, we see God's eternal righteousness burning against sin, yet him providing a sacrifice for us so that we are not destroyed. 
So that sums up the burnt offering rules for the priest. Then you get to the meat or the grain offering, as we call it. So the grain offering is something that would be performed by the priests where they would take this handful of flour and with oil and incense and they would burn it for a sweet smelling savor. Now the person could have brought a big bucket of uh, offering or a barrel, but you generally will offer just the handful. And the priest, whoever performed the sacrifice, the offering, they got to keep the rest. And, but the, there was a rule. They had to eat it in the presence of God in the tabernacle, specifically in the holy place. That's in the first part of that tabernacle tent. If you're unclear on that, we did a series on the tabernacle before. So they had to be very careful with this offering that there be no yeast in it or no leaven, as the Bible calls it. This offering is considered extremely holy. And even though it was an optional offering, which makes it kind of unique, the other, the required offerings were also holy, like the sin offering and the trespass offering. But this was an optional offering that was also considered holy. In the same setting of the grain offering, there was a special kind of grain offering that if there was a new priest, a priest that had just became 30 years old, that was the age when you started serving, as soon as they became 30, you would have to dedicate them to the service of God. So you would give them 10 percent, you would take uh, the priest would have to offer 10 percent of a bushel of flour for a grain offering. They would give half in the morning and half in the evening. So the predecessor to this new priest, um, sometimes their father, sometimes not, um, would then offer, make this offering and it would have to be completely burnt. So the new priest was going to be completely dedicated to God. It was not eaten by any of the other priests. Nobody else got to eat from it. So this one was a complete dedication to God. And again, here we see the picture of Jesus Christ. The grain offering was a voluntary offering for everyone but the priests. Well, so they, were, they had to give it, but everyone else it was voluntary. That means while anyone is allowed to give thanks to God for the good things in this life, only the priests, which of course we've talked about before, symbolizes the Christian is commanded to take communion with Jesus Christ and with other believers. It's a vital part of your life. We're not talking about necessary for salvation. The only thing necessary for salvation is accepting Jesus as your savior, realizing you're a sinner, need a savior and accepting Christ. So, but the point being for the Christian, there's a lot of things we are commanded to do, such as baptism, such as communion, um, and, and among other things. But the point being, that's not what gets you saved. So the offering given by the priests it is 10% of the bushel, and that's going to remind the people how God provided for them in the desert, of course, because remember in the desert they were given manna from heaven, and they had to gather that every day, because what was the point of that? Well, you can't offer, you can't say, well, I read the Bible yesterday, or I prayed to God yesterday, or I um, had a relationship with God yesterday, that's good enough for today. No, it's every day that you renew your relationship with God. Whenever you start your day, whenever you end your day, in the morning and in the evening, you need that close relationship with Jesus Christ if you are a Christian, or in this case, a priest. Um, it's also a reminder that to those in the ministry and, and to all Christians, you are to support the ministry. You are, I mean, again, we talk about the tithe. That's an Old Testament concept, about 10% of what you make given to God. New Testament, that 10% law doesn't exist, but there is a tithe in the sense that you give whatever God has prospered you. You could give five minutes of your time or $10,000 of your salary. Doesn't matter. You're free to honor God in whatever way you can because you are earning rewards for heaven. Again, nothing to do with salvation, but has to do with inheritance and rewards. And that's a different topic. Maybe we'll discuss one day. So when the offering was given for a new priest, it had to be entirely burnt. And again, that symbolizes Jesus Christ, who completely offered himself to God, even to death, the death of the cross. He was our true high priest. Um, okay, so then we uh, we get to the peace offering, but this is getting a little bit long, so we'll uh, we'll pick up with the peace offering on our next visit. So if you have any questions, please um, uh, mark them in the comments below. Send me a message. God bless you. Um, hope you enjoyed this post on Learn the Bible.